Just a few things to set up this morning so that you've got an idea of what's going on here and why we're here. This, uh, as it turns out, is a good message for fathers on Father's Day, for families, for all of us who are Christ followers who desire to genuinely be about following Christ. One of the great movements in this country, in America, the Christian community in this country, is for the megachurch. And I think Jesus has something to say about all of that as we look at how God worked in history and how Jesus specifically taught his disciples throughout history that they were to bring a message and salt and light into a lost and a dying generation. As I look around and as we go out and talk to people on the street and as I just chat with people even as we're getting ready to go out to the conservation camp and, and, and spend some time with the prisoners there, just talking with some of the guards and some of the people there, uh, some of the prisoners that have actually been leading that ministry for a while. Uh, some of the people that come in here on Sunday morning that, that uh, either visitors or for whatever reason they're here, and I hear all the things that they're looking for uh, as they go to church on a Sunday morning. And... A lot of the things that we're purporting to say that is important with regard to church, a lot of the books on the bookshelves of Christian bookstores across America are geared toward this, how do we increase the numbers of people coming into the church? And that seems to be the, the largest goal is to increase, put people in the chairs, put people in the pews. Uh, I remember a, a lunch, Elba and I were eating one time in North Carolina and and in the restaurant, there was in the next booth, there was a couple of pastors sitting there, an associate pastor and a senior pastor. And their whole talk throughout the whole conversation of the meal had to do with strategies for bringing people in the door, strategies for doing this and that and something else. And all of it was very mechanical, very methodical, very... I didn't hear a word about Jesus the whole, mess, the whole time we sat there. I didn't hear a word about following what the Spirit has for us to do or listening to what God's Word actually says. And this morning we're going to be looking at some parables of the kingdom. What is the kingdom like? It's interesting to me, when Jesus starts telling these parables, what has happened? You know, I've, I've talked to you a lot about over the, the last year and a half the context of a particular scripture. What is the context? You know, we, we've seen examples in the past week or two where preachers across America that are getting a lot of notoriety are ripping Scripture from its context, if they have any Scripture at all with reference to what they're saying, rip it from its context, and then preach a message on something that has nothing to do with what the Bible is talking about. So as we look at this, I want us to see, and so I'm going to begin right before Jesus begins the parables. Because right before this, Jesus is confronted with one of those things we've talked about as we've looked at the, at the book of Luke, that Jesus is confronting the religious leaders of his day about their perversions of God. And it comes in the rules and regulations they have laid down in order to try to keep God's law. So the things that man has laid down in order to try to keep God's law Jesus is coming against and saying that's not the heart of the law. That's not, that's not what it's really all about. You're, you're, trying to, you're trying to put dots where dots don't block and cross L's instead of T's. So Jesus is going to have something to say. But let's look at the context of this as we begin to get started. Here, here is what comes right before these parables begin. And by the way, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking this morning. We're going to be in Luke 13. We're also going to be going back in just a moment to Matthew 13 to look at Matthew's account of this same situation, okay? So here again is the context. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues, that is Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. So make note of what is actually taking place. Jesus is teaching and it's on the Sabbath day, okay? Now that was a day that, that they came to the temple to be taught and Jesus is doing exactly what the religious leaders think he needs to be doing. He's teaching. So here's what happens. And behold, there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. Uh, perhaps you've seen people like this. I see it a lot more in third world countries than I do here. 
but she was she had a but it, this specifically says it was caused by a disabling spirit. Uh, she was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, "Woman, you are freed from this disability." And he laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. I want to stop right there and make a couple of notes. First off, I want you to note that the woman did not come to Jesus asking to be healed, that Jesus called her to himself. Secondly, Jesus doesn't require anything of her. It had nothing to do with her faith. It had, it had everything to do with her need. He called her to him, and he heals her. Now, for those preachers that are going around the world, supposedly in miracle services, and people don't get healed, and they blame it on the person because you don't have enough faith, I point to this scripture. Amen. The woman had, had, had to have no faith. She didn't even ask Jesus to be healed. She comes, and Jesus is there, and he calls her over and says, that you're healed of this. So I just make note. Write it down in your Bibles or someplace when somebody tells you that it's essential that you must have faith in order to be healed. Not always. Sometimes Jesus compliments somebody's faith. Sometimes he says, because of your faith you were healed. But in this occasion, Jesus, Jesus doesn't require any of that. So just make note, it's not a formula. And that's about what, G, what the, his, Jesus is going to attack here in the way of the, the religious leaders. He's going to attack their formulas for trying to keep God's, God's law. Okay? So... The woman, you are freed from your disability, and laid hands on her. Immediately she was straightened up, and she glorified God. What is the woman's response? She glorifies God. What ought to be our response for our next breath? To glorify God. The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. I love those two things. That we, As we glorify God, we're, we receive the greatest joy that we'll ever receive in our life. I'm already hearing testimonies coming out of the care ministry. People said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being blessed. I'm being, I'm, I'm being blessed to be able to bring glory to God through servants to His people. It, it is, it's, a, it's a joy to serve Him. And he says that when this woman's healed, her first response, her first inclination, her first explanation of anything is to glorify God. And I just give that to you for what it's worth. And he laid hands on her immediately, she's healed. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, now notice he's not addressing this to Jesus, he's addressing it to the people. He's trying to start controversy. And rather than address the one who's done this, he's trying to raise up a crowd that will come against Jesus. So he says to the people, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days to be healed and not on the Sabbath day. Now, we're going to see in a moment Jesus' response to this. But it is important to note a couple of things. First, Jesus saw her need. It wasn't just a desire of hers. She didn't come with a desire of her heart. She came with a need, and Jesus saw it. He didn't need to be reminded of it, and he addressed it. Now, what does that say? Not always does Jesus require that we even come to him. Ought we as Christians to come to him in prayer? Absolutely. He desires that. He, he asks us to do that. But all of us, I think, that are Christ followers that walk with the Lord can legitimately look back on our lives when we weren't walking so close with the Lord and go, thank God Jesus was there at that moment. Thank God I didn't have to have enough wisdom to even ask. Thank God He was there to pull me out of the pit when I didn't have enough sense to ask for, to be pulled out of the pit. Thank God He was there to pull me out of the pit when I kind of liked the pit. Amen? Okay. So... Notice that, and notice too, Jesus is responding out of love. There's not one thing here that is going to benefit Jesus at this particular point of his ministry 
This is about His love for people. This is also about showing His authority over all of creation. This is about the planting of the church so that people would come to know exactly who Jesus is. So all of those things are important here. But Jesus heals on the Sabbath. He's criticized. And the, and the, the ruler of the, of the synagogue, now let me address who that is. We're not talking about the high priest here. The ruler of the synagogue, the, the, the title ruler of the synagogue, many times was a lay person in, in the synagogue that took care of the facilities, who set up the order of who was going to speak when, basically oversaw the, the things of, that were going on in the temple, but he wasn't necessarily a teacher of the law. But it is him that is bringing critique on Jesus to the people trying to cause a problem. Let's see how Jesus responds. Then the Lord answered, You hypocrites, plural. Interesting. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from her bond on the Sabbath day? Now, it's interesting that that one of the translations says right here where it says on the Sabbath he untied his ox. The, some translations say, that you have in front of you may say you loose your ox. You, it is loosed. And then down here he says ought this woman not to be loosed from the bondage that she's in under Satan. So here, here is the connection Jesus is making. This, this is... And let me just tell you what the rules were concerning oxes and donkeys on the Sabbath day because this is pertinent to the discussion here. The ox and the donkey on the Sabbath day, a person could go in and lead his ox out of a stall and take him to water as long as he wasn't carrying anything else in his hands but the lead line. If he was carrying anything else, it was a sin. That was the rules. That was out of the Talmud and the Mishnah, the rules for keeping God's law. Those were man-made rules, not something God had uh, ordained. Okay, So they're trying to keep man-made rules for keeping God's law. Now, we we always get in trouble there when we try to do stuff like that. But they they could lead the ox out, and they could lead him, and they could pump water or lower the, the bucket into the well for water and pull it back up. They could pour it into a trough, (coughs) <coughs> the ox could drink out of that trough, but if they held the bucket for the ox to drink, that was, that was over the line. That was work. Now you see the, <coughs> the issues here regarding the law. But now Jesus said, this donkey you'll loose, but the woman you won't have loosed from a burden that Satan has put on her. Let's weigh this out. Now, according to Jewish law, those, by all standards here, those animals had more value than this woman. And Jesus says, no. That's, that's not the way it ought to be. That's not the way God is. God puts value on this woman. He gives her value, and, I, and she ought to be loosed on the Sabbath day. If you'll loose a donkey and carry him to the water... This woman ought to be loosed from a a demonic spirit that is binding her and bonding her and has for 18 years. Can you imagine? 18 years, she's been bound, tied up by demons, physically, emotionally, every other way, and Jesus is saying to her, this day I'm loosing you. The ox didn't ask to be led to water. The woman didn't ask to be healed. Jesus says, you're loosed, you're free. I, I, I untie you. Now, let's look at, the, at Matthew, because it is in this context, the, the freeing of this woman, the criticize, criticism of Jesus for doing this very thing on the Sabbath day, that Jesus then begins to tell the parables. And he's going to teach us something in these parables, and there's a lot to be learned here. I'm going to focus only on one thing today, with regard to this issue that I brought up earlier with the megachurches and how God tends to work in his communities. 
Now, I'm not here to preach a message against megachurches. I once thought that would be my calling, that I would just be God's gift to the megachurch. You know, I'm, so I, I'm, I'm not here to criticize that. I have noticed, however, that, that in megachurches, the, the effort, a lot of energy is put into trying to get small groups to meet. Why is that? Because God is working in those small groups in ways that, that he doesn't and hasn't planned to in large groups. I just plant that as a seed as we begin to look at some of this this morning. Let's look at Matthew's account, Matthew 13, start in verse number 24. So on the heels of Jesus healing this woman, on the criticism of the synagogue ruler, uh, of him trying to stir up uh, some angst among the, amongst the people against Jesus, here's what, here's what Jesus does. He starts telling this parable. He says the woman should be loosed, and then he starts telling these parables. Now, the reason I've gone to Matthew is Matthew tells more of them than Luke does. But Matthew gives us a larger account. We'll bounce back and forth between Matthew and Luke this morning. Here's what he said. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Now, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God we use synonymously this morning. There are some people that make distinctions between the two. For purposes that we're going to look at them this morning, I think for most purposes, that's, that's the same thing. The kingdom of God is not necessarily, now watch what I'm about to say carefully, is not necessarily and is not exclusively heaven. The kingdom of God is right here, right now, working in the midst of this community and in the middle of this church. The kingdom of God is working now. So as we read this, keep that in mind. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares or weeds among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore again grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves or the servants of the landowner came to the came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them or tear the weeds out of the field? Here's here's the response of the master. But he said, No, for a while you are gathering up the tares. You may also uproot wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest, and in time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, first gather the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up and gather the wheat into my barn. Then the disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable. Now, Jesus is going to explain this parable. He's not going to explain the others after this. So get this while you can, okay? Uh, the disciples came to him and said, please explain the parable to us concerning the, the tares in the field. And he said to them, the one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. It is Christ himself. And the field is the world. It is this whole world that we're living in. For as, as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. These are the children of God, the ones who God have, has saved and out of this world. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. They're the very agents of the enemy. They're the ones going around, and he's saying, they're all mixed together in this field, the world. The world also includes, by the way, inside the walls of the church. The world is everything here. The word there is cosmos. It means everything God has created. He says, all this is mixed together. And what the the servants are doing is questioning, is that right? You've probably heard of these religious groups that go to a mountaintop and they they sell everything and they go on a mountaintop and they're waiting on God to return. They're waiting on the Lord to come back again. And and they wait and they wait and, and, and nothing seems to happen. Well, their leader got a vision that their comet's going to come by. Remember that? Hale's, Hale Bop Comet? That whole thing. We had a cult in, in Colorado right around the corner from us 
that it was very much like the hale bopp comet. They thought that there was a meteor going to come, and they were the only saved ones. Now, by the way, just for your attention here for a moment, that was a missionary Baptist church that had gone astray. So just because it's got a name on it doesn't mean that it represents God or represents the work of Christ. So here we are, he's saying all of this is mixed together, but he's essentially saying this, I'm not sending you into the world to rip those out of the world. I'm not sending you as servants of God into the world to rip those out of the world. I'm sending you into the world to be mixed in with them. And then in the next parable, he's going to tell us and show us what our work is. Okay, so we're getting one piece of it now. We're getting another piece in the next parable. He says, they're all mixed together and the, and the good seed comes from the sons of the kingdom and the tares from the sons of the evil one. Verse 39, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil and the harvest is the end of the age. When the end comes, the harvest, he says, is that's when the harvest is going to happen. So none of it's going to be taken apart until the harvest happens. And the reapers are angels. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, what is that a picture of? Hell. I've I've had a conversation with a guy this past week over the internet who says, well, I don't believe that hell ever appears anywhere in the Bible. I've referenced this scripture for him, among others. There, is, there, there definitely is a hell burning with fire, so it shall be at the end of the age. Some will be gathered up, some will be put in the barn, and some will be burned with fire. And the Son of Man will send forth His angels, and they will gather out of the kingdom all uh, stumbling blocks and those who committed lawlessness. That's when it's going to happen. That's when the wheat and the tares will be separated, is at the end. You and I, I make note here, you and I are called to be in this place at this time by a holy God for a purpose, which we're going to get to in a moment. Mixed together. We're not to go isolate ourselves. We're not to go be ghettoized. We're not to go be isolated. We're not to pull ourselves out of the world. We're to infect the world with His goodness. All right? So that's our call. He says he throws them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Notice he says, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun. In this world, many that are genuinely doing God's work will not shine forth. In fact, let me make a bolder statement. Most of those that are really doing God's work are not going to shine forth before the world. There are stars in the church as far as the world is concerned. But where the work is being done, I tell you there are not those that shine before the world brightly. The world will put a spotlight on those that are making the big bang as far as the world is concerned. Where there's big parades of stuff before you every Sunday morning. Where the world shines forth and shows that that you've got the, the ability to entertain the people. Bring them in. Bring them in the door. We had a church not far from us in North Carolina, the fastest growing church in America has campuses all over the United States now. They, put on, they, they call their, their Sunday morning a performance. My, my dear friends, this is not a performance. This is God's Word. And it's to be understood as God's Word, not Dave's Word. It's not a show. It's not entertainment. This is for the hearts of God's people. Then, at the time of the, the, that the end comes, there will be a separation of the wheat and the tares. And then, he says, then my children will shine. Then, their works will be made known. Then, people foresee it for what it really is. Then, those things done in the quiet 
will be revealed not for your glory, but for God's glory. That's when it's going to happen. Not, not here and now. So now let's go, let's look at some of the ramifications of this. He allows both to grow until the harvest. There's no ghettoization, there's no isolation, there's no segregation from the world. It's all mixed together. And our mission is in this world and to this world. It's, it's God's work to clean it up. I, I, I have no responsibility for cleaning it up. My responsibility is to share Christ with people. My, my, I don't have, listen, I don't have the responsibility to save anybody. If you're sitting here this morning and you're not saved, it's going to be the Holy Spirit that does that work. It won't be Dave Seifert, I, I can assure you. Yeah, we, we, throw, we, we put it out there and the Holy Spirit takes it and does the work. So here's, here's, the, here's the problem. There was a different expectation among the religious folks of the day than there was with Jesus. Now, here's the problem in America. We have made the church so much about entertainment and so much about the size of the, of the organism that it's more about that and the stardom of its leader. I've had, I've had an opportunity to be the star. That's a dangerous place to be. And I fear that place. But the, the expectations of the people were quite different than the expectations of Jesus. Here's their expectation versus what Jesus predicted. First, they expected uniformity. Here's the rules and regulations, the laws of man that will help you keep the laws of God, and we expect you to tote the line. Toe the line. Keep every law that man has made in order to keep God's law, and if you toe the line, you're going to be honored for that. So that's their expectation. Here's what Jeremiah 3.17 said. At that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all nations will gather in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord, no longer will they follow the stubbornness of their own evil hearts. Don't you look forward to that day? Well, let me give you some really good news. We're not there yet. Now, believe it or not, that is good news because that means God's still got some work for you and I to do. He's still got a mission for you to accomplish. Jesus predicted pluralism. The mixing of the wheat and the tares. He predicted that this is going to continue to the end of the age. And he's saying, this is the way it's going to be. And listen, this is not because the enemy is winning, that it's because this is how God is going to refine his people. This is how God is going to bring new people to the kingdom. This is how God is going to work in societies and cultures around the world. This is God's plan for healing the cosmos. So don't think it's strange. Remember that that quote, don't think it's strange that these things happen. They're, they're, it's, it's part of the, of the understanding of who, what is happening before us. Throughout history, the church has sought to impose a uniformity on society. And this uniformity is not God's plan at all. It's not God's plan. The, the plan is that you, as, as Christ followers, would come into the church and that you would go out and be something different in the world. We'll see that in the next parable. Okay, so Jesus is teaching them something about this very situation that he has just had. Because there's or some of Jesus' followers, I'm sure, that were going, well, Jesus, just cast those religious leaders out of the temple. You're, you're the king of kings. You're the Lord of lords. What, isn't it now that you've come to establish your kingdom? And they had very different ideas about what they expected of the kingdom than Jesus had. So let's look at some more. Then Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? What is this kingdom of God really like? He's trying to help them understand what it is that they can expect. What is it, Kent, that they can expect? And by the way, you, you all need to be praying for John as he leaves here. I know he's dealing with some illness right now, so please be in prayer for him. Uh, Jesus says, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? So now he's going to teach us. It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air perched in its branches. Now let me bring some explanation for this. 
Mustard seed, we learn in Matthew, is the smallest of the known seeds at that time. There are smaller seeds, by the way, but at that time, that's the smallest of all the known seeds. It would grow a huge plant. Now, it's not the mustard plant that we think of today, which is a tiny little thing, but we, used, we had a plant in our yard in Arkansas when we were there that was very uh, similar in terms of its growth pattern to what was being described here. As this mustard seed was planted, it would grow very quickly. We, this plant would come up in, in the beginning of the spring of the year in our yard in Arkansas, and it would grow and grow and grow, and it was a stalk, and it would shoot out limbs and big, huge leaves on it, and it went up 30 feet in the course of one growing season. And so this, this plant would come up, and that's kind of what this, this plant did that they're calling a mustard plant here which a man took and planted in his garden, and it grew and it became a tree, and the birds of the air perched in its branches. Now, all through the Scripture, the birds of the air are often a reference to evil. So here's what's happening. This plant grows. It's a productive plant. It's a good plant, but the birds of the air come and nest in it. They come and perch in it. There is an infection in it. There, there is a mixture. And, and you, nowhere in this parable or anywhere else are we told to go out and chew the birds away. We ought to be calling them into the church. When, when, we, when we sit in, in judgment, we, 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 can very da- we can be very dangerous people that are called Christians. Somebody asked me when I first came here, that very first day I walked in the back of the church and there was a group of people in here that sat on the, the pulpit committee. They asked me, so what would your ideal church look like? I say, well, the whole front row would be full of prostitutes and people that, yeah. Because we, who needs to hear the gospel more than, than people who self-identify as sinners? So here, here, here we are. He says, don't go shoo the birds away. That's what happens. Expect this. Expect it. And so there's pluralism. There's the, there's the mixture of all of these together. Uh, the, those that expected... The, coming of the Messiah, they expected him to explode onto the scene, to set up his kingdom. Suddenly he would establish his kingdom, wipe out the Roman rule, and here he would be. And Jesus comes in with a gradual growth plan that most church growth movements in this country would not appreciate at all. He comes in and he says, this is the way it's going to be. It's going to be small, it's going to be inconspicuous, and it's going to have very small beginnings. Again, he asks, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? He, again, he's bringing people back. He's asking the same question. What is the kingdom of God like? Is that not what we should be looking for? Or should I establish my kingdom here? Should I establish my growth plan here? He's saying, what is it like? It's like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Now, In other places in the Bible, yeast is used as a symbol of evil. Don't think that it has to be used the same way every time an example or an illustration or analogy is used in the Bible. I believe God here is giving us yeast as what we ought to be to the dough of the world. So that's the context of this message, is it not? Okay, that's what's happening here. Context, context, context. That's what's happening here. In other places, it's used to represent evil. But in this case, it's not. It's a permeation. We're to permeate the world with the yeast of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To share Jesus with a lost and dying world. And listen, that's the only thing that's going to genuinely change hearts and minds and lives. It's the only thing that will help. I I can't get enough psychology degrees to go out and save the world. So it's the Holy Spirit's work in this. It's a permeation of God's children into an infected world. This is God's plan. Kingdom exposed from, or imposed from the top down. Jesus says the kingdom will quietly infiltrate the world. They wanted the king to come on the scene and just put everything in its place. And Jesus says it's not going to be top down. 
I'm going to plant my seeds in the world. They're going to grow up. They're going to bring about change in people's lives. The Holy Spirit's going to do His work as those faithful servants speak my word, witness to people, tell them about Jesus. That's how it's going to happen. Both pictures are not growth apart, but growth within the culture. We're not called to separate ourselves on a mountaintop or in a monastery. We're, we're not called to be communal in our, in our nature to where we only let so many in and that's all that, that can come. Or only certain types in and that's all that can come. Not everybody can join this church. I'm pretty careful about talking to people before they join this body. But I want everybody to come in. You hear what I'm saying? I want everybody to hear the gospel message. I want everybody to know Jesus. Both portray God's desire to impact the world not mainly with power, but with His love. His power will come when that second coming comes. And it will be overwhelming. It will radically change things. But it's not, it's not the way He said we're to be working now. Jesus is giving those people then and us instruction. This is what you need to be doing. You need to be going into the conservation camp and share the gospel. You need to be going to the streets and share the gospel. You need to be writing cards and making telephone calls and sending DVDs out that really are good teaching and share the gospel. So you get the idea, we share the gospel. Both suggest not a massive institutional overwhelming the world, but an underground grassroots approach to doing ministry. Both allude to the improbable and, and very ironic way God chose to intrude into humanity and into human history. Here's how Jesus sent his son. Out of the clouds, bursting onto the scene, taking over the world government. No, born in a stable. In the backwater town of Bethlehem. Going to choose rulers that have the right bloodline, right? Right? No, sh shepherds and fishermen and people and tax collectors to bring, to make, to make what seems foolish to the world domineering in the world. This is how he ch is choosing to save the world. Great kings and rulers usually are born of royal blood, and Jesus is suspected of being illegitimate. Great kings and rulers usually born with privilege of, of a certain ethnic group and Jesus is born to the hated Jew, Jewish race and occupy, in an occupied country. Usually of the upper class born to a poor laborer in a despot, dis, despised district and well known and he was utterly, utterly obscure. Aren't you that carpenter's son? overcome their rivals and enemies and kill and Jesus uh, saw killed and disgraced by his enemies he, he was hung on a cross stripped naked beaten abused bled real blood died a real death buried in a real grave resurrected from that grave but in his life beaten and abused persecuted Usually these great kings and rulers recruit the key power influencers and Jesus does recruit these ignorant fishermen and nobodies. The great kings and rulers gain a huge following. The following of Jesus slowly actually diminished almost to nothing at the time he's crucified. Who's standing at the foot of the cross? His mother? John? Everybody's, everybody else is left. All, his, all the ones that were going, yeah, we want to be part of this. You're doing great, Jesus. Keep calling those big crowds. The crowds had dispersed. Nobody wanted to be associated with a guy that hung on a cross. It's almost nothing at this point. Nothing. And Jesus gets down to almost nothing and comes back and talks to those, basically those 11 that are left in the, in the upper room when he appears before them and gives them their instructions. You remember what those instructions were? 
you know, go, go to Jerusalem and pray until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When the Holy Spirit comes, then you'll have the power to do what I want you to do. It's not going to be obvious to the world what I'm having you do, but when the Holy Spirit comes, then you'll have the power to do what I want you to do. And there is a great distinction there between those two. 1 Corinthians, let's look there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, the base things of the world, to de- and the despised of God He has chosen. The things that are not, so that He may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast. The things not wise according to the flesh, not mighty, not noble, not, not brilliant, but the foolish things. That's why God called me. Don't laugh, that's why I called all of you too. Because, see, here's, here's the truth about all of this. Those guys, see, you're looking at me as God is using me now. And all those people that knew me before are watching the Internet and they're watching this stuff, and here's what they're going, I can't believe that. I can't believe people actually show up to hear Dave Seifert speak on a Sunday morning. Well, if, I, if all I had to tell you was what Dave Seifert thought, I'd have nothing to tell you. It wouldn't be of any value anymore. But he, God chooses these weak things of the world, the despised things of the world, the foolish things of the world. Jesus consist, consistently circumvented the usual paths to power and influence. His model reflected his teaching that godly leaders don't lord it over others. He, he, he says, I'm going to choose these weak things. That way, nobody's going to come and lord it over you. But serve them. Serve those that are. Don't be, don't be expecting to be served, but serve them. Underlying assumption, the power of God's love is a real community. A real community. A community of God's children doing God's work and God's power according to God's timing. That's the expression of God's love. That's the nature of what a small church ought to be. It's the very nature of what a small church ought to be. People loving people from the inside out and to the outside bringing them in. People loving people. Real people have needs. There's a whole lot of people sitting in churches across America today that look better than me, smell better than me, smile better than me, and they're hurt worse than me. They need a Savior. And we need to bring them in no matter who they are, what they look like. I got a burden for a guy when we were in North Carolina. We first started a little church down there years ago. Uh, Denver Baptist Church. I know some of them will watch this as well. And we had 12, 13 people that met in a little t- storage room behind a used tire store where they stored old tires. And we met in that little room. And that was a community of God's people. And that little group loved each other and they, and they didn't hesitate to bring them in from outside. And, and I, I, I remember one of the leaders of the church said there one time to me, his name was Ralph, and Ralph said, there's nobody who's so messed up that we shouldn't invite them in and, and realize that yes, they are messy. Yes, they are high maintenance. Yes, all those things are true. And yes, Jesus loves them. Amen. And this is what the small church ought to be. We ought to be those that can bring the yeast into a culture that is, that is permeated with so much disease and disaster that God's Word begins to take root and realize it's going to be Him that does the work. 
Jesus consistently circumvents this power. Uh, on a, this ragtag group, he predicts this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world. These 12 fishermen, despised Galileans, talked with a twang sort of like we do. Disgusted those that were among the elite religious leaders. He, bring, he says that it'll be on those that will bring the message to the whole world. I, listen to me very carefully. Listen to me carefully. I do not believe God's plan has changed. And I believe He's got some yeast to plant into Redway and Garberville. And I believe some of that is right here. And if we'll be faithful, He'll use us. And that faithfulness will be such joy in your life. I can promise you, it's a joy unlike any joy that I've ever experienced. I've been blessed and cursed to have some high highs of worldly joys. And it does not compare. If we will be faithful, we'll see that God will use this little body and it will be preached to all the nations. Christianity is neither white nor western. God is the creator of all people of the earth and His love, forgiveness through Christ applies to all people. The beleaguered, the broken, the educated, the uneducated, those that are hurting other people right now and those that are being hurt. He has forgiveness for them all. A few mission statistics I want you to be aware of. This is from a 1996 book but, uh, or paper that was written. But I want to give you these figures anyway because I want you to see something about the difference between how God is working in some other places in the world and how, what's happening in America right now. Do you know that there's more churches in America right now closing their doors than opening their doors every week? There's more churches in America failing and getting smaller than growing larger. There's more churches in, the, in America compromising the gospel to try to keep people in the church afraid they'll offend somebody than, it, than are preaching the gospel. Now that's, that's the American statistic, but look at the rest of the world and, and be encouraged. The world Christian movement reaches nearly 90,000 people a day. Over 3,000 churches are planted every week. Most of them not in America. Most of them not in Europe whole lot of them not in Europe. Europe is sinking. Africa, 20,000 people per day are being saved. Korea, 1,900 uh, no Christians and considered unreachable. In 1,900 there were no Christians in Korea. Get, you get that? None. Zero. None in Korea. Now 35% of the Korean nation is Christian. That's north and south. In 1949, China grew, uh, since 1949, China grew from 1 to 50 million under intense persecution with the government coming down and persecuting them. Yet in America, our churches are getting smaller, our churches are closing their doors, our churches are, are losing the very core of what the gospel is about. Now, there is a short short view of this and there's a long view the short view is let's just whatever we got to do to get them in the door let's get them in the door the short view is get them in the door get them saved get them out make room for another group coming in god's message to us in matthew 28 18 and 19 the, the the sending out of his disciples the great commission is go into the world he didn't say go into the world and make saved people he said, go into the world and make disciples. You teach what God teaches. The long view is, you get people God's Word. And you share what God says. And you teach what God taught. And you, you don't try to make compromises. You don't try to skip the, the bases. In baseball, you, don't, you can't say, well, I wanted to hit a home run, so I ran to first and back to home. God's got a long view of this. And here's my problem. Every time I think I've got it down, I say, okay, God, that's where you want me to go. You want me to go to Z? 
I'll go from A to Z, and here's a straight line. That's the way you want me to go because that's the shortest distance between two points. That's man's way. And God says, I want you to run to first base, and then to second, and then to third, and there's a whole lot of people along the way I want you to talk to. And then you can come back home. But you've got to run the bases. And the reason is that there's people to talk to. It's not the shortest distance between two points. And that's what the church growth movement is doing in this country for the most part. It's trying to entertain and get people in the door and send people home with warm fuzzies. This morning you're not going to go home with warm fuzzies. You're going to go home with, with understanding something more about who God is and what he's doing in his church. But I do believe God's still got a core in America that he'll raise up, that'll make a difference. And they're scattered like little bits of yeast all across this country. There are those teaching the truth of God's word. And my prayer is that this place will be one of those places where God's word's taught and lives will be changed. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the good yeast of your word, your children are planting in a lost and a dying world among a lump of dough that is failing and falling and missing and hurting in desperate need, filling their lives with the things of the world <laughs> that make them feel good for the moment. And Lord, help us today to see the truth of your word and to, and to grow right where you've planted us, Lord. In a very lost and a very dying place where good seeds need to be planted. Help us to be faithful. I pray in Jesus' name.